how do you want to die? This is the black pill, and on this channel, I guess you would have thought we'd have talked about this already. All right, the question is not, do you want to die? The answer is almost certainly no. People, as a general rule, don't want to die. But you must die. Uh, it's inevitable. It's a fact of life. Our only birthright is death. And since you have to go, have you ever thought about how? What would be the best way? Well, if you ask most Americans, you're going to get two answers. One, asleep and painlessly. I want to die asleep in my bed and never know that it happened. Right? You want to go to sleep one night and wake up dead the next morning. Blissfully unaware. Uh, the other answer is I want to die at home, surrounded by family. That's how the dog dies. That's how the dog dies. When the dog, family dog, reaches the end of their viable days on Earth, when the cost of buying them another day or another week is too high, when their quality of life is over, we take the dog to the vet. And we lift them up onto the table. The vet puts uh, a, a tube into one of their veins that injects them with a lethal dose of anesthetic. So the dog goes to sleep more or less gradually and dies in their sleep while the loving family stroke their fur and tell them they're a good dog, they're the best dog. That's how the dog dies. That's not how Americans go out. Americans tend to go out in the hospital after a battle with an injury or more likely an illness. Uh, probably alone? Because people need to sleep and eat food and take showers. They go out full of tubes and covered in medical equipment and an alarm rings because their heart is stopped, the crash cart comes, the nurse reads the do not resuscitate order, and the person's gone. It's not how I want to go. I do not want to go asleep peacefully in my bed. I don't want to go laying on the table while friends and family stroke my fur and tell me I was a good man. When I was a clinical counselor, um, sometimes, sometimes appointments wouldn't show up. People wouldn't show up for their appointment. Uh, they'd call, they wouldn't call, but either way, suddenly I have an hour of free time in the middle of a day, and I'm a graduate student, I'm exhausted, I don't really sleep. You know, this is a perfect opportunity to take a nap. So, I lay down on the therapy couch, close my eyes, and my favorite game was to drift off gradually, drift off gradually, and try and track that moment when consciousness has become sleep. Of course, you can never quite grasp that. Of course, that moment is ultimately unknowable because the sleeping mind can't detect that it is the sleeping mind. But I was able to come close. I was able to come close. Yeah, to fall into sleep and be conscious of falling into sleep. That's how I want to die. I don't want anesthetics. I don't want anything that'll muddle my consciousness. I don't want to go in my sleep. I want to be awake. Uh, look, man, I'm a scientist. And I think what happens when you die is that you experience a moment of pain, then your consciousness just dissolves, and then you fade into the background radiation of the universe. In quantum, they know that information is never gained or lost, but the information they mean is like the top or bottom spin of subatomic particles. It doesn't mean us. We are lost. We're lost. We're forgotten. We forget ourselves. I think that's what happens, but I don't know. I don't know it. 
nobody can reliably come back from the dead and tell us. The only way to have this information is to gain it for yourself. This is the last thing we ever do. Dying is the last thing we ever do. And I don't want to be asleep for that. I want to be awake for that. So then people say, but it might hurt. And, uh, shoot, man, life hurts. Life hurts. Life is full of pain. It's full of grief. It's full of wounds and injuries. It's full of the stuff we do to ourselves. How many of you good listeners go to the gym a couple times a week and pick up heavy stuff and put it down again until it hurts and then do it a few more times just for good measure? How many of us have tattoos on our bodies? My sister did a half sleeve on me. We only had a day, so we had to do it all in one day. It was like a seven or eight hour sit. And the first four hours were okay, I guess. But the last four where we're doing shading and going over and over the same territory, that got to be about as much as I could really mm, handle. And it was worth it. Right? Life hurts and it's worth it. What are you afraid of? Well, the two ways people are most afraid of dying turn out to be drowning and burning. And we have reports from people who have drowned and been resuscitated. And what they tell us is trying not to drown is the worst part. Right? Being under the water and needing oxygen that's the worst part. The CO2 in your blood rises to a point that your uh, hypothalamus is screaming at your brain stem to breathe and trying not to, to resist the impulse to breathe. The terror of that and the pain of that, that is the, that is the horror of drowning. But then when the person... Uh, it, when they're overcome by their brainstem, the body starts to breathe on its own. Well, that part's not so bad. Breathing the water, it's uncomfortable at first, but then there's the slow in-out motion of breathing and drifting off, drifting away. O2 sats decline, consciousness gradually flags, the body goes cold. But the people who've been through it actually report this stage being somewhat peaceful, actually, somewhat peaceful. Burning, now there's a terrible way to go, but most people who die in fires die of smoke inhalation. They never feel the pain of flame touching their body. And then in the few instances where someone is burned on purpose as torture, well, the initial touch of the flame burns the pain receptors out of the skin. And when the skin is gone, there's not much left of us to feel pain. Surviving a fire and going through the skin grafts and so forth, you tend to be comatose for that. If you're not comatose already, the doctors will induce one. Uh, because that's, that's nothing to go through. That's not a thing anybody wants. But again, there's the terror and then there's the initial pain and after that, the, the person reports feeling cold or numb. Uh, when it comes to death and dying, there's a special group of people, the military, army. Uh, army folks have a special fantasy, generally, uh, about dying. They're sort of conditioned in basic training that their unit is their family, right? The people they're serving with are their brothers, and so their death fantasy tends to be that they'll die somehow meaningfully, that they'll throw themselves on a grenade and prevent everyone else from getting blown up, or they'll be first through a door and take a bullet, and because they took the bullet, someone else doesn't take the bullet. Something, of, something heroic of this nature. Heroic, you know, more concern for, for this family, these pseudo-kinship bonds. Um and that is as fantastical as any other kind of fantasy. Americans tend to die in the hospital. Soldiers tend to die in friendly fire incidents or training accidents. 
At least that's the tendency in Iraq and Afghanistan. In those two wars, more soldiers died again in uh, training accidents, friendly fire incidents than did in any kind of enemy action. Now, part of that is because of the injuries people are surviving. In Vietnam, if you were hurt, your buddies had to drag you out of the jungle to a clear spot big enough for a helicopter to land. And the helicopter would get you to the, the forward operating post and then mash, and then they would stitch you up as best they could, put you on a plane back for uh, a, a plane back for Germany. And in Germany, the surgeons would put you back together if you were still alive, but eh, people get shot in the jungle and they often don't make it that far. But now we're embedding medics with the forward operating units and the medics have super glue, an amazing innovation in first aid. Those, those highly trained medics with the tools they have in their packs, they're saving lives. And then they get back to the forward operating post and they shove a soldier on a, on a converted C5 hospital plane. And the surgeons who formerly were at Rammstein or something are on the hospital plane. And so people are surviving with injuries that were not survivable uh, 30 years ago, certainly not in Vietnam. Well, that means another consequence is people are living through injuries they expected would kill them. And we still, even now, don't really have the infrastructure to support people with multiple limb amputations, blindness, and brain damage. The ultimate story of all this is that death is banal. People are looking for a good death. Sometimes that means a meaningful death. For the, for the military, especially, people are looking for a meaningful death. And sometimes civilians, someone in class answered that way today, you know, I wish I could be martyred for a, for a good cause, that my death means something afterwards. Um, but usually the good death is the peaceful death, surrounded by family, by the trappings of meaning, and unconscious and without pain. But death is banal. Death is a biological process. It affects us biologically. Our systems just stop working, and then fluids leak from our bodies, and our brains stop working, and we sort of fart our way off into the, into the cosmos. There is no good death. There is no meaningful death, and if there were, the dead person's not around to experience it. There's only banality. So this has been the banality of death.